Welcome to the Uncommon Senses Podcast. In this special series, Sustainability, where we spill the tea on sustainability, we will discuss issues that centers around the environment and human development, specifically companies, technologies, policies, and individuals. In this series, we have a special co-host, Ms. Leanna. She is currently pursuing a major in sociology and global sustainable development in the University of Warwick. Without further ado, let's get started. So the next thing we can talk about is so-called environmentally friendly products and how they're increasingly becoming commercialized. And it's like, I don't know about you guys, but for, I, I see tote bags mm. everywhere now, like reusable yeah. bags, they're everywhere. And same with like straws and um, other co- like reusable cutlery food containers and things like that. Obviously, a very important question to consider is like how long it takes um, to offset the impacts of their production. Um, So I'm guessing you guys own some environment, like so-called environmentally friendly products as well. Yeah, I have actually in our in our university, we have this initiative called Uni Green Eats. So basically, if every time you eat a vegetarian yeah vegetarian meal on campus um they will give you a stamp and if you have five stamps they give you a reusable cutlery and you have 10 they give you a reusable like uh like a container food container and if you have like 15 you 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 get a chance to you know have a blender draw and yeah that's kind of what i own right now and of course i have my own tote bags whenever i'm like shopping grocery shopping and stuff yeah oh god that feels so bad now i, I can't think of anything that i own <laughs> it's like <laughs> environmentally friendly which... i guess water bottle is yeah water bottle ah, is yeah yeah oh but i don't know if this is environmentally friendly but i don't drink water <laughs> like when i'm outside <laughs> like i don't yeah i don't really I don't bring water bottles and I okay. don't buy water or drinks either. I yeah, I just wait until I go home. It's unhealthy but better for the environment. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but like yeah, it's 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 really weird because like you know, we talk so much about environmentalism, but personally I've never really engaged in any uh like groundbreaking efforts or like or even like personal efforts to kind of like be environmentally friendly. I can't just live my own way. So yeah, I guess it's time to change. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, a lot of the times with like environmentally friendly products, I do feel like they there are too many of them mm. in some ways. Because for example, with cotton bags, they're not easily mm. recyclable. And especially because like when companies give you um, or sell tote bags they have to print a logo on there or like they just have to print like patterns and stuff on them but a lot of these dyes and like ink they use are actually pvc based and so you can't recycle the bag mm-hmm. and also tote bags are just a they're, they're like a branding and advertising tool and at the same time cotton packaging is also luxury wrappings mm-hmm. so it's like luxury handbags for some reason have to come in a cotton wrapping as if being made from leather is not bad enough <laughs> and yeah and it's like this is not to say that cotton is worse than plastic but it is worth thinking if every product needs a bag and also like it's so many cotton bags in the first place like so like we mentioned in like the previous episode we talked about how we don't actually need that many like so-called environmentally friendly products because theoretically they are permanent or like you can reuse them over and over again but if we keep producing them and like keep using it as like an advertisement tool and keep making it like something that is just stylish and trendy then we're defeating the original purpose of these products in some ways so now that we've talked about the issue of consumerism and corporations we can talk about us as consumers so first of all do consumers really have the power um and like as consumers do you guys and like being consumers who are also 
very aware of environmental issues and sustainability. Do you guys think you have power? I guess like now that we've, I've done some more research, then I, I feel like I, I can, I, I know what choices I should make. That's like mm-hmm. the actually best, be, better for the environment than what I, you know, was conditioned to believe in. Like just that previous example, the cotton bag thing. I guess if I'm at a grocery store and like, they asked me, do you want a plastic bag for five cents or do you want to buy a, you know, a, a reusable bag? Then I will probably go with the plastic bag because I know that once I bought that recycling bag, like the reusable cotton one, I will not use it again. Like, because I have a lot already. I have a lot of them already at home and I don't think I will use it again. So I will use the plastic one because I also can use it as my trash bag. So I, I feel like to that extent, I have a little bit of power in terms of making my choices. In terms of like corporate governance, um, I think um, the pu- the public tends to have more power during like times of like economic de- prosperity in like dictating what the business does as opposed to when like there's like an economic distress because um, I think so like when there's like an economic dis- like a depression or like an economic distress i think companies tend to care more about like their survival they don't really care about um what uh like oh being you know environmentally friendly or how like other people sees their um their uh, how people perceive their company itself i think they just try to like make their products you know affordable they try to make it you know mm-hmm. just enough for them to stay afloat and to be in the market but i guess like um during times of like a strong economy or perhaps like a um times of an economic like prosperity i think um pu- the public tends to hold more power so 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 let's put it this way so the purpose of a corporation is intrinsically linked to the public that it serves be it like gaining profits from customers or trying to influence like widespread behavior so therefore the market fluctuating and divided as it may be has like significant power over like which corporation should remain in society and which should be eliminated from the market where um corporations have fail, fail to adhere to like perceived ethical codes of society or like what is considered like appropriate by the public tends to be you know um eliminated so um especially like during like a times of a strong economy where like um customers and the public are given more choices to choose from so like this competition kind of like i guess acts as a force for um ensuring that like companies like act according to the ethical codes that has been deemed um appropriate by society so i guess like it really goes both ways it really depends on the external environment like and and this, this is a small additional point to that is that i think companies like sometimes likes to give the illusion of choice so mm-hmm. i think you've all seen like conglomerates who own several brands so like as a consumer you kind of think oh i'm choosing a completely different brand like this seems better but if you just trace it back they're all owned by the same like mm-hmm. mother company so you're not really there's like this like monopoly in the market anyway so you can't really change anything so i like in short i'm not really sure i don't really know anymore i just Mm. yeah yeah and i guess like from your last question i don't appear as a a particularly um ethical customer (laughs) i just buy what i want i guess so um yeah there's also another argument to to be made where like are do are we good like um indicators of ethics like are the is the public um reliable or dependable in like determining what what is ethical and what how business should behave because like you know the public could be like very divided also like very um undependable yeah like there are many external things that seem beyond our control and sometimes like as a consumer myself i feel very frustrated because it's like i can't get anything right it's like everything (laughs) i buy is probably horrible Um, But then at the same time, there are little choices that we can make. And I think like within the public, we aren't, we aren't as fragmented um, Mm -hmm. as 
we might be. And I think the first example I want to give is consumer watchdogs and also just a lot of NGOs with, um, that give a lot of media exposure and pressure. So, for example, like I'm sure you guys know the Hong Kong Consumer Council um, is a statutory body that collects, receive and like disseminate information about different goods and services and they give advice to consumers and they give advice to governments and businesses and a lot of times they just expose like um problems with mm. advertising like how uh, uh, people advertise like their products and services mm. and they they also make this knowledge public and accessible via press conferences and the news and it's like whenever a news report comes out my mom would share it on our family whatsapp group as well so <laughs> <laughs> nice. yeah and also Greenpeace um, everyone's heard of it it's an international organization but with local branches around the world and I don't know I don't know when this was but they discovered that several local supermarkets in Hong Kong sell so-called deforestation meat so like meat coming from animals mm. um, that come from farms mm. that come from deforestation and they held meetings with these firms and also held press conferences to let the public know about this and so in some ways they're kind of bridging the gap between like consumers and corporations and governments I think mm. and also just as consumers I think we mentioned this earlier like we have to be critical about sustainability claims and like actually make sure that companies are because obviously companies respond to consumer demand so it's up to us to make sure that they're truly transparent and honest and the other thing I want to talk about is also how, so obviously it's about making informed decisions, but it, it doesn't have to just apply to consumption of commodities, but also resources in general. So for example, and in this case, cooperation between consumers, corporations, and governments are definitely needed. So for example, in the UK, the government um, has decided to roll out these so-called smart meters by 2024 and it's basically um, installing digital meters at home, which will show the cost and amount of energy you're using pretty much instantly. And so I think that would be very, very helpful, like, so that I'm at, I actually know, like, because when you're using, you're actually using electricity and gas, you won't think about, mm -hmm. like, how much that's going to cost or, like, what impact that has, but, like, actually being aware of it instantly could actually be a good first step to help us change our habits. So going back to the point about like accessing information about environmental issues, hmm. like how do you guys find out about environmental news normally? Um, for me, it's mostly about, so like, so, so, so there's two channels. The first is kind of depressing. It's like whenever <laughs> the news like kind of talk about, <laughs> oh, which forest is set on fire or like what depressing like warning signs has experts warned us about and <laughs> how like, you know, just, just general things on the news. And mostly it's about like when disaster strikes and people lose their homes, they die or like, you know, something disaster is happening. And the other source is just like I guess documentaries and also like, um, like you know shows you see on like YouTube that just you know informs mm. you about like, um, very interesting but also very depressing facts about you know what's happening to our world and, yeah, I guess that's mostly how I get most of my information. Uh, oh, and also like um, you can also get information from like schools, I guess. But I guess they tend to go into a more cliche or like more scientific like approach. Mm -hmm. Like, so a lot of their ex they they use like very generalized examples uh, and stuff like what's currently happening. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I I guess like if you really keep an eye out, you can really see like information all around you. But yeah, I think it really depends on you on how to choose information and how you choose to like perceive these issues yeah same i think now i totally agree with the youtube documentary ones i think some of them are honestly really fun like i've been watching i just previously watched the tomato farm like tomato jam tomato sauce video on that and um, a lot of times it's like i kind of just research like i i don't i don't really go on you know i guess a lot of young people now get they get their information from tiktok or instagram or whatever and i'm very kind of skeptical towards those or um 
I, I think there's just so many things that you know information nowadays to just present you what you want to see and is not usually to some extent is not 100 percent you know accurate because maybe some other research papers have shown things otherwise so i do read some like research papers um if i have time and if i want to you know read them yeah but yeah i i feel like just i don't really get i don't want to trust in any information that i get too much because i know that you know someone else might think otherwise or their evidence is to suggest otherwise and for sure i don't i wouldn't really get information from like claims of a certain company like you know like h&m and their stuff yeah. like i wouldn't you know really trust what they say especially like a promotional one maybe their reports i guess perhaps their reports might be better than you know what they just claim on the website but then I don't I don't like reading re any of the reports. <laughs> no one likes that. But yeah, I think really just re you have to read a lot and you have to think a lot about the data. Um yeah, it, honestly, okay, it was very interesting. It was also a very eye-opening experience. So I was researching about like fashion waste in different regions slash countries. So I did the one for um Taiwan, I did one for Singapore. And I remember I found their official information. I found their official reports and everything. Okay, Taiwan does a fa fantastic job with compiling all of their information on waste, different kinds of waste. It's so detailed. They have a fantastic re research about that. Um, and these numbers are really, really good, really accurate. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so I was doing that. And then basically... Even those numbers, those statistics um, can be somewhat misleading. I didn't realize that. I just presented all of my findings in a, in, a, in a spreadsheet and then presented it to my supervisors on my sustainable fashion project. And they were like, wait, look at this data. Look at this data, 2020. Look at how you know much their fashion was just dupl duplicated. Like it, their fashion was just suddenly increased a lot in that particular year. And then naturally, you're just going to think like, oh, maybe they just throw more waste on that year. Maybe like they wear masks or something. But then like my supervisor should suggest it, like look into the ways which they measure their waste. They, they changed their method of measuring fashion waste in that particular year. And actually, yes, Taiwan did change how they report these numbers and statistics in that particular year. Like before it was done by one government department and then uh, the other year it was done by another one so that's why that's why it caused that significant change in numbers and taiwan like officials actually wrote a report which you know identifies that problem that issue so i think that was just extremely cool to witness that thing in action like you know so your supervisor just like saw the data and be like yeah there's something wrong with this Look, look into this, look into that. And I honestly appreciate there there's so many governments that, you know, put in the effort to actually do um, reports and also, you know, do just conduct investigations on their, their statistics and their numbers. So, yeah, that was just really cool. I think that those are also some ways that, you know, you can you get access, you access to information about environmental issues and you also think critically about them i think that's very important yeah yeah critical thinking mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and i think that's a very interesting point that you have about like the sometimes misleading or even like deceiving nature of mm -hmm. um scientific reports and how we like um receive our information from and you know relating to back to like what uh, liana has said and how like mm -hmm. there are so many like you know ngos out there that you know are clearly making a great effort in trying to like um help our fight in combating like climate change and like mm -hmm. environmental degradation like but at the same time like um as we've mentioned, there could be like really um, deceptive or like misleading information. And, you know, it reminds me of this case that I saw recently about this organization called humanewatch.org. So um, 
you know, they, their fashion statement says that they want to keep a watchful eye on the animal rights movement, and they're sponsored by the Center for Consumer Freedom. And you know, just from like their web page and just from like hearing their name, it feels like you know they're a very legit NGO. You know, they're doing their scientific research. But the more you look into their like organization and the kind of like message they preach, the more like um. The, the more that you think, the more suspicious it gets because they're, you know, all their articles are about how, like, oh, the animal rights movement is very rigged and how they're, like, you know, they are part of the, you know, big government plan to kind of constrict consumer freedom and kind of, like, um, smother these businesses. Mm -hmm. And so the more research you actually do on it, you later realize it's actually a deceptive front group for industries that profit from like animal cruelty. It's like, so mm -hmm. I guess like it's just back to like um, what we said before about like astroturfing as a tool for um, greenwashing. Like sometimes these companies could like fund research or like they kind of create these like fake NGOs or like very realistic looking like um groups this is designed to fool people into thinking that oh um perhaps to, to to fool them into questioning like the um perhaps even like the environmental movement and perhaps like all those um other industries that are trying to actually do good so like yeah I guess it just um brings back to the point of how we have to really keep uh we have to be vigilant and to keep a very like critical mind when we're trying to like look over this information as not all information can must be true and like not like just because it's online doesn't mean that it's um it's there for your education it could there could be like ulterior motives attached to it yeah so it's like obviously you can go like the most reliable sources of information will always be like the academics and like the science of it. But then I think as general public, sometimes these things aren't super accessible. Like I can, I can read actual academic journals, but that's not accessible to the general public. So, mm -hmm. and so that goes back to like NGOs, like environmental NGOs, not like those um, fake ones. Um, and also can, like, like, the um, consumer council, like consumer watchdogs, like mm -hmm. them disseminating their information through like more mainstream media or like social media. That's very important too. Yeah, totally. And even for like, I think like watchdogs for like um, scientific journals, because sometimes you look at a very like quote unquote groundbreaking, uh, groundbreaking report that says something mm -hmm. like, oh, um, for example, like, oh, chocolate is actually good for your health and how it reduces like um, hypertension, uh, risk for hypertension, all of that. And then you like kind of look at their sponsors and like, who actually wrote this like <laughs> article um, and it's actually sponsored by like the sugar industry or like <laughs> a, a chocolate company. So of course they want you to, you know, to think that chocolate's good for you because they want to like increase profit. So yeah, I guess yeah. like, uh, thank uh thank god as you mentioned there's so much like you know consumer watchdogs and stuff but i guess sometimes information can get really muddled up because there are like real watchdogs fake watchdogs watchdog for watchdogs so there's just like so much like yeah I, like information out there that sometimes it get, can get really confusing for laypersons like us i think so far we've talked about like we've focused on like, what we can do as consumers um but another way to look at it is probably from a structural perspective so as we know the economy today is very much like input process and the output but what if we make it circular um so have you guys heard of a circular economy before oh yeah it's like you know the waste kind of gets recycled in right so is it that one I, yeah. i'm not sure yeah 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 so basically like in the circular economy, materials are viewed as assets that need to be preserved rather than continuously consumed. So instead of ownership, we have stewardship instead. And it's actually not so focused on recycling because I think we've mentioned before as well, recycling processes can actually be very energy intensive. Mm -hmm. And so instead, it kind of encourages companies to take back the goods they sell and then reuse, repair, and then remute. Um, manufacture them so this is hopefully this is an accurate um example and not too simplified but for example if i 
bought like an iPhone 12 and then five years later, I don't want it anymore. Mm -hmm. But Apple is going to take it back and then reuse those parts on a new product they make or repair it and then sell it again as, I don't know, like iPhone 12.2 or something like that. Um, however, obviously it's very idealistic and there's a good reason why we haven't, like we, we still don't really have a very circular economy, um, despite all the awareness around it. So what do you guys think about a circular economy? And is there anything you guys want companies or governments or just any other institution to start doing in order to become more circular and truly green? Mm. I mean, iPhones looks like they're recycled anyways. Their idea looks like they, <laughs> like each iPhone looks like, <laughs> like, like there's no, no oh patience. Oh my God, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh. but like in all seriousness, I think, um, yeah, it reminds me of this like video about like no waste cooking. So like, they they use all the materials they have like from the eggshells to like you know they they really have like zero food waste created after they um during like their cooking process and it really got me thinking like I think because you know I think a number one and number two like um biggest waste in Hong Kong is like food waste and I was thinking mm. it'll be really cool if we can find an idea to really um reuse so, uh, like reuse or like upcycle something like food and i know it's very difficult because you know uh for food like it's perishable it's also like it really has to adhere to some a lot of like um hygienic standards and sanitation all that kind of stuff uh, but like like recently i've i've seen like movements um that promote you know tying fabrics with food or creating natural dyes with food and i think like you know the more we play around with this idea i think the more like you know the more you know, solutions we'll find. And I think, you know, if we, you know, if we really find a way to completely upcycle, you know, food waste or like to you know, really create a, a circular economy around the food industry in the future, I think that would be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like the mentioning of food waste because I think the issue of food waste is so stupid. Like we have enough food. It's just a distribution problem. And mm -hmm. We're just throwing food away. Like it's, I, it, it just kind of, it's just such a stupid concept for me. You know that we we are having food waste. Like, what do you mean we are having food waste? I just feel like, and I feel like circular economy. Yeah, I do think that it, it should be somewhat in the back of the company's minds whenever they're doing this. I think the um the example of iPhone I think that's actually a pretty nice example of because e electronic waste is you know gradually increasing as we are living in a very tech you know society right now and I think there's also a lot you can recycle with anything related to metal I guess um and I feel like the whole thing is that this circular economy thing shouldn't only be applied uh, at the end of life stage so like r after you use the product but i think it should be something kept in mind when the companies are producing the product like in your manufacturing process you should also consider about your waste and how do i circle that waste back to the economy because i think if you're only doing the end of life things with the customers then it just it's just another marketing campaign you know presenting yourself that you're very green even though like that's you know just preventing it from going to the landfill is only one part of um environmental protection um there's so many more that i think firms should do to consider um in other stages of the um you know products um life cycle so yeah, yeah i do think it's a great concept and it should yeah. definitely be something that firms are mindful of uh, but then I feel like I just hope they don't do it just for show, but they actually you know, yeah. really carry the essence of that. Yeah. I like that you mentioned the whole life cycle thing, because another key thing about being able to re uh, reuse and remanufacture in the first place is that when you design it, it's more universal. And mm -hmm. so I think, I think so far, circular economy 
like there are ideas of circular economy that implement it into different policies and things like that. It's it's not like a revolution or anything, but it's like an attitude that's being recognized more and more. And it's like recently, I think, is it the EU? I don't remember. I, I can find the article afterwards. Okay. But then basically, I think they decided that they have you have to universalize like charger, universalize it. That means you don't need a new one every time you get a new phone or something like okay. that. I think I don't remember which company it was, but I think they sued the decision originally, but then they didn't win. So and like another thing I wish would come true is like again it's like a whole life cycle thing like mm. I want supermarkets to go packaging free mm. but then it's an issue it's not an issue of individual supermarkets it's also the entire supply chain mm. and it's like um there's this packaging free like not supermarket but like a small grocery store near my home and I walk past it every day mm. and then one day they were getting their delivery while I was walking past and then I saw so many cardboard boxes and it just hit me Ooh. like right the supermarket's packaging free but then every, it, it comes from packaging like a mm. non-reusable packaging yeah. yeah yeah that's actually so true like it also I think it, you can think about like see like wet markets in Hong Kong I think it's sort of like a form of packaging free grocery shopping like you can just request them for for just don't give me the plastic bags and i think they were used for styrofoam from what i've observed like they used it to pack another round of vegetables the other day and some of them has those um plastic boxes where they get their uh, produce and stuff yeah i think it, it is like the wet markets in in, in chinese culture you know, it just, it doesn't just do bad things like the virus, you know, it's, there's, a, I think we can learn a lot from sustainable practices from them. But yeah, I do get how, you know, packaging free stuff, I think it's kind of hard to, to do because it's also, I, I think, I think Japan, a lot of their food has a, a lot of packaging, like they sell food as like, just cut in half. And they just, wrap it around in plastic um, and they sell it like that's just a very I don't think that's a very sustainable way but then I also understand they did it in terms of like consumer experience perspective but yeah I think there's just quite a lot to go and there's a lot of things to learn uh, from different cultures and their markets as well yeah it's also a matter of like sanitation and like product protection because you know, packaging serves a lot of purposes. And, you know, I do get like how, um, you know, there's this environmental consideration to it, but um, is it practical to completely eliminate the use of packaging? Um, you know, it, it is an ideal situation, but, mm -hmm. you know, practicality, like practically speaking, maybe, you know, I think society still need to go a long way to like find out a better method of storing products. Mm. you know if they want to reduce the use of packaging so yeah it's definitely something worth discussing so i guess the final thing we can talk about for this episode is to go back to the idea of freedom we mentioned at the beginning so a lot of the times like people who are against these ideas of having to be more environmentally friendly and having to be more conscious about like the environmental impact of our actions and also environmental regulations in general. How does it make you feel when people say it's our freedom to you know, pollute and like do whatever you want and things like that? Yeah, I mean, I feel like this whole thing about environmental consciousness at this stage in like in terms of individual level is so de dependent on your own morals and what you think is right. You know, there isn't like a law that says I, I, you, you, you can produce certain amount of waste. Like, yeah, you know, like I think in other places there might be laws like you can only produce one bag of waste per per day, um, or else we're gonna charge you. But then it's just not here in Hong Kong. You can waste how matter how matter what you uh, whatever you want. You, you can if you want to recycle, you can recycle. If you don't want, you can just chuck it in land the landfill bin. There is so 
reliant on you know, yourself and your standards. So, like, I feel mean to tell people like you should, you know, you you should recycle. You should reduce your usage. You shouldn't buy all of these fancy clothes for you know, the way you look because it's just an illusion. You know that your identity is dependent on fashion or stuff like that. But yeah, and I just personally feel like. Yeah, I'm possibly infringing on their freedom in terms of that because there isn't like a set rule or law that tells me or tells these people what to do. So I don't think I have the right to really tell them what is right. But then I do want to, you know, perhaps influence others and like, you know, let them know that the, the, the truth or like the reality of the environment and the world that we're living in ra- right now. So, yeah, that's my view. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting point you've made about like infringing on other people's freedom. So, and a case that comes to mind is that to what extent is incarcerating a criminal infringing on the criminal's freedom to do crime? Like, I think um, you know, from another perspective, you can you can say that you know when we choose to live in a society, we choose to make certain sacrifices to, so like we can all like live together in harmony and try to like, you know, to uh, maximize the good that comes from like living in a social circle. So, um, um, and I would say that like uh, part of that price would comes comes from like you know having your freedom inhibited in terms of um making decisions that involves the environment and also like involves like um you know the harm of others but i think the question is where should we draw the line so like you know uh, and this has been like an ongoing uh, debate for quite some time now. The debate about, you know, to what extent should we use law, uh, regulations and social policy to um, limit people's ability to um, act freely, um, you know, um, and to limit their ability to do bad and to kind of like mm-hmm. this kind of like really utilitarian uh, mindset and maximizing goodness in society. So... Yeah, um personally I personally I I I I I do get like um like I, I do think that people have like their freedom to do you know whatever they want but I think um there's going to be like social repercussions. So if you see a person that's you know is making these really unethical decisions, you're gonna think badly of them, and I don't think they're gonna be really well received in society. So you know, you know they will get their like um, <laughs> karma, social karma. I'm not sure, like they they're come up in so to speak. So yeah, so I guess just you know believe in. <laughs> Like perhaps like a form of spiritual sense, believe that you know nature will balance everything out. If a person mm-hmm. does bad to nature, nature would you know come after that person sooner <laughs> or later. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the regulations that we need are not like putting you in prison. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's not like things that we need to do aren't actually that extreme. And also, I think what you were talking about Joshua is also like a good segue into like the idea of tragedy of commons which is like this hypothetical situation where animals are grazed on a common pasture and individual farmers are motivated to bring in more of their animals to increase their private benefits but at the same time every additional animal you bring would degrade the pasture a little more and so if all farmers do the same because of their private interests the pasture will ultimately be destroyed and everybody loses and so regulations at the end of the day are just needed to internalize the externalities and yeah so that these social costs won't become catastrophic in the future and like finally just a very good quote from aurora which is (laughs) a norwegian singer probably introduced to me um is that in one of her songs she said you cannot eat money when the last tree has fallen and the rivers are poisoned so Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. Respect yeah, honestly, yeah, listen to Aurora's songs. Like she yeah. she has so many songs about nature, not just mm-hmm. those like 
love songs, but like she she writes really nice music. Yeah, you know, it's funny because like uh, at first, like I thought you meant like Aurora from like Sleeping Beauty, so I was very confused. And then I searched up uh, like the quote, and I realized it was from a song. I was like, oh, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. songs can really inspire and. You know, if we can make more songs about like you know saving the environment, maybe we can inspire more people to to care. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think in pop culture for sure, like less songs about money and you know new cars yeah. and stuff, more songs about nature, please. <laughs> yeah, especially with like certain genres of songs, I think they have this focus on like oh um when to have like sex, money, and those kinds. So if we can really just get the energy and change it to something that's like about the environment i think you know that could really do a lot of good for society yeah thank you guys so much for listening to our podcast and our special series of sustainability and we hope to see you next time on the uncommon senses